Thanks, Kibel. And uh, now I'd like to introduce our second guest speaker, Hojin. Hojin is uh, also a spokesperson for the Australian Kurdish Association. She's also a lecturer and tutor at Newcastle University in Political Science and International Studies. Yes. Correct? And, uh, yeah. Sibel, you're such a hard act to follow, so I'm going to have to try to be extra witty and funny and interesting and have lots of, you know, horror stories to capture the audience's attention. So I'm going to do something a little bit different to what Sibel did. I'm going to explain who the Kurds are, um, give a brief account of some of the issues that we face within the Middle East, and I'm also going to be talking about my own personal experiences and that of my family, some of whom are sitting here in the audience at the moment. Um, my auntie and my cousin, they're very happy. Um, and I'm basically going to explain how, as Kurds from uh, northern Iraq, from Bashrut, which is southern um, Kurdistan, how we escaped the Saddam regime, and how we ended up in Iran, and some of the political, social, economic um, issues that we faced as Kurds, simply because we were Kurds. So the era in which I was born in was a terrible era. I was born in 1983. Um, I have to think for a second, how old am I? 1983. And during this time, there was a, the Iran-Iraq War. Uh, the 1979 Iranian Revolution had just occurred. So the region was in huge turmoil. There was a lot of changes in policies and in the identity of the regime so that had been stable for, certain, for a certain period of time. So when I was born, there were several wars uh, occurring at the same time. There was the war between Iran and Iraq, um, with all the proxy powers trying to provide support to either side, tacitly or implicitly. Um, but at the same time, the Kurds, as usual, they're always in trouble. They're always starting some sort of a fight or a revolution, trying to demand independence. Uh, were directly resisting against the Ba'ath regime's um, oppressive policies, basically. On the other hand, the Kurds in Iran were also directly, directly resisting the oppressive policies of the Iranian regime. So this was a very complex situation to be born in, and it wasn't a very nice place to be born in. Um, so my earliest memories were basically of my family escaping in the middle of the night with my cousins um, and uh, my aunties, and basically escaping for our lives in the middle of the night and carrying whatever we could, um, basically for fear of our lives. So there were some very, very negative experiences and stories, and I'll try to um, explain some of the, uh, the, the ones that I can speak about, um, and I'll try to um, make, make this story as humanizing as possible because we are speaking about human beings here. We are speaking about people like you and me who had to escape in the middle of the night for their lives. So when we escaped, we had to leave basically because the bath regime was coming for us. Uh, it was just basically a matter of hours. My uncle had, and his family had already been detained by the Ba'ath regime. Um, we had basically no other options other than to basically run. So what we did was we paid a bunch of people smugglers and a bunch of um, <laughs> um, people to provide us with horses and we decided to escape from northern Iraq to into northern Iran. Now unfortunately for us, and there's a lot of unfortunately involved in any story that a Kurd tells you, um, unfortunately for us, as we were escaping, we went through the town of Halabza. Some of you may have heard of that name before. If you haven't, Halabza is a very small city in northern Iraq, and it's basically about uh, it's about 10 miles um, from the border of Iran. So we're escaping, and we're thinking, yeah, everything's going well. You know, we're giving the finger metaphorically to Saddam, and we're escaping. We've made it. Everything's really fantastic. Life is good. We're alive. You know, we've seen some horrible things. We've had to hide in a few caves. You know. Um, it's, you know, watched a few bombs fall all over us and had to run in the middle of the night, stop, start again. So eventually we arrived in this, um, in this small town, well, probably a more of a city than anything else, and we're all on horseback, and I remember being very small, probably about four years old, and I remember very distinctly my uncle and my father becoming very alert and telling us that they were dropping chemical weapons on the Kurds. And so we had no supplies, we had nothing, we were a bunch of children, women, we had nothing, we had three or four males with us, um, some male cousins, some of them who were Peshmergas. And so the only thing that we had was um, the female scarves, the scarves that we just wrapped around our necks and we just ripped it into shreds, gave it to the children, uh, soaked it in water and basically pressed it against our faces and, you know, we tried to get out as soon as possible. 
Unlike the 5,000 people that died and the 7,000 people that were directly injured as a result of these chemical weapons, we were the lucky ones. We managed to escape out of Halabza by literally an hour. Um, some of us were injured. Um, I know that my mother had um, burns all over her hands and body. When we arrived in Iran, we could not seek help or assistance because we were Kurds and we were enemy number one. So we basically had to run in order to be um, prevented from being herded into refugee camps. Now, they're called refugee camps, but really there were spaces of horror. There were spaces where people were documented, our names were written down, and it was there was no life. There was, it wasn't a condition in which you would want your family, your children to exist in. And so we ended up in Iran. Uh, we ended up living in Iran for about seven and a half to eight years. During this time, we decided that we we're going to apply to Australia and come to a liberal democratic country and we were going to be safe and we wouldn't be discriminated against anymore. And living in Iran was very, very difficult. There was no, there was basically no human rights there were, as a Kurdish person or as any minority. Um, the Kurds had always resisted the regimes that we had existed within and so we were very, very unpopular and not liked very well. Um, I don't know why. Maybe it was because we were constantly demanding human rights and um, it was never actually provided to us. So living in Iran was incredibly difficult. We were living in abject poverty. We often went for very long periods of time without food. Um, the possibility of having a job was near to non-existent. Um, because there was such a huge mass exodus of Kurds in that region, um, even trying to find jobs in a black market or so-called black market was near impossible. So we lived in abject poverty. We lived on the charity of others. We lived on the kindness and love others, and often others who did not have anything to give themselves. So we were in uh, Iran for a couple of years, and then in 1991, the American powers decided that they would encourage the Kurds to resist, as well as the Shiites, to resist the Ba'ath regime. So um, I'm not sure whether foolishly or courageously we decided to stand up. That didn't work out very well. Um, Saddam decided that he was going to try to continue eradicating us. And so what we had was literally um, several hundred thousand to number of numbering millions um, of Kurds who went directly into Iran or directly went into Turkey or tried to get into Turkey. When they arrived on the borders of Turkey, they were stopped and literally shot at by the Turkish border guards. These are innocent women, children and civilians literally escaping while the Saddam tanks were chasing them and bombing them. And they've arrived at this border, and instead of having these borders open to them and having international aid and humanitarian aid provided and supplied to them, they were shot at. Um, it was so ridiculous that the villagers around that particular region resorted to sneaking basically scraps of bread across the border to starving hundreds of thousands of people, many of them women and children. Many perished because the Turkish regime refused to open its borders. So that sort of highlights another problem within the region. Um, often when there are conflicts, we have nowhere to run. We don't have anyone, we don't have any friends. If we run into Iran, we're persecuted even further. If we run into Turkey, we're shot at. There's no way we can go into Syria, there's a civil conflict occurring there. There's no way, and there's no avenues, there's no support, there's no way to go. And often many of us stay back and are uh, basically left to perish. So eventually my family decided that they would apply to come to Australia um, and that was a wonderful experience. It took about eight years, as I said, to get here. The first time that the um, application or the visa was received by my family, a really wonderful day, only to open the letter to find out that the visa was expired. And so we thought, oh, okay, that's really fantastic. Or Kurds will persevere, we'll just apply again. And so it took another three and a half to four years before we got on a plane and came to Australia. And so now here I am, and I'm talking about the Kurdish issue, and I think it's important for us to speak about what's happening about minorities, not just in the Middle East, but everywhere. Whatever you look, if you're a minority, you are oppressed, you are silenced, you are repressed, your identity is dismissed, you are not valued as a human being, you are seen as lesser. And so I think the reason why the Kurdish question right now is so prominent is because it's challenging a lot of dominant ideas and values on the international system. Um, <clears throat> lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, so I think we need to understand that the Kurdish, what's happening in Kobani is an incredible, it's a historical moment, for, not just for the Kurds, but for all um, minorities within the region. 
But I'm also wary about hero worshipping Kobani. Kobani is a huge, historical, amazing moment in time. And we should value it, we should try to understand what's going on, and we should try to provide support and understand and analyze why the Kurds are doing what they're doing, who they're resisting, and who are trying to stop them, who, are, who is trying to stop the Yepaga and Yepaja forces. But at the same time, it's really, like I said, very easy to romanticize these situations. Okay? At the moment, in the last two days, we've had airdrops into Kobani, and that's fantastic. And so suddenly there's a lull in inf information and media being produced. And during this process, we've had the ISIS terrorists redirect their attention towards uh, Mount Sinza, which is the region where Shingal, where Sibal mentioned previously. And now we've got about seven, eight thousand, nine thousand uh, members of the heavily persecuted Yazidi Kurdish community on this mountaintop. They have their ancient um, sites of religion there. It's a huge site of pilgrimage. And they're all in direct danger of being massacred, the women kidnapped, the children stolen and radicalized and used as future jihadists. But now there isn't much attention on, the, on this because suddenly we don't have these really handsome and beautiful Kurdish fighters, female fighters or handsome young men fighting, you know. You've got a bunch of civilians who are hungry, thirsty, who do not have any help, do not have any supplies, stuck on this little mountain in the middle of nowhere, terrified for their existence. And so we have to be careful of that romant romanticization and we have to focus on the daily occurrences of injustices. Not just when we have a siege, you know, we've got 35 days where this city is directly being bombarded by these terrorists who are horrifying and they, they behead and kill and rape and take anything and destroy anything in their path. But we have to think about the daily occurrences of injustices that occur to people on a daily basis, especially when you're a minority in the Middle East. Because to be a minority in the Middle East is to not exist at all. And if you're a Kurd, then that's a whole different category of non-existence. So I think um, it's important to understand who the Kurds are, because the implications of what the Kurds are doing res will resonate for, for a very, very long time to come. Yes, we are democratic, we are liberal, we are pro-human rights, we are pro-animal rights. We are very, very supportive of environmental rights and protecting the environment, which is entirely unheard of by any organization. But yet nobody is trying to help us. And the reason why nobody is trying to help us is, well, there's two major reasons. The first is society doesn't know who the Kurds are. When they see Yepaga and Yepaja forces, all they see is Al-Qaeda, all they see is ISIS terrorists, all they see is Free Syrian Army. They're all combined, they're all mixed up together. We don't know who is who. It's very hard to determine who is the good guys and who is the bad guys. People don't know who we are. So it is essential that we speak as a Kurdish community to the Australian community, but it is also important for the Australian community to listen and to ask questions and to try to find out. Because as Sigal said, it's not just we're not just fighting for the Kurdish rights. We're not just fighting for women's rights. We're not just fighting for children's rights. We're fighting for humanity. And it may sound like a very distant idea to think, well, you know, they're dying over there. Who cares? What? How does this impact me? I'm still going to get on the train and go home and probably have my glass of wine and put my feet up and watch Big Brother or, you know, some reality <laughs> TV show. Um, but the reality is, you know, it does impact us every single day. We know, as Sybil said, that large numbers of Western um, citizens have entered or gone back into Syria. Radicalization isn't something that occurs overnight. People do not become radicalized within an hour or a day or two. It's something that exists already within our society, and it is something that already exists over there as well. So what we have to do as a community is try to understand who the Kurds are, what they're doing, and what we can do to help them, because by helping the Kurds and helping the Yepeg and Yepega forces, we're helping ourselves. Now, another reason why the Kurds aren't receiving the help that they are is because the Western community, NATO, or the other, um, the other states that we mentioned previously, have basically shot themselves in the foot. The reason why the PKK is on the so-called terror list, especially in Australia, is because uh, it's basically an economic, social, political relationship with Turkey, with a nation state that we have nothing in common with with a nation state that advocates and pretends to be democratic, but is in reality very far from it. And yet you have the Kurds, who are secular, who are pro-human rights, pro-humanity, all of the positive aspects of you know, Western culture that we support and we highlight, and yet they're the terrorists. The Australian government has basically, as, along with the United States and NATO, shot itself in the foot by putting the PKK on the terror list. And now it can't provide support to the PKK or the Yepaja or the Yepaga because they're offshoots of the PKK organization. Because to do so, they would be actually um, revoking or 
basically acting illegally against their own laws, which is to provide funding to a terrorist organization. So instead of reviewing some of these laws, and instead of actually considering why does the PKK exist, why do we have such organizations? People don't wake up one day and think, I'm just going to go on a killing spree and, you know, this is what I do on a Sunday afternoon because I've got nothing better to do. People organize themselves and you have organizations who consist of 40, 50, 60,000 people, young women and, and men who come together in order to defend their human rights because there are vast ongoing human rights violations that occur every single day and nobody speaks up. And so when nobody speaks up and you're an ethnic group and you're under significant amounts of pressure, you will resist and your resistance is a human right. It's a resistance that is justified. It's a resistance for your very existence and for your identity. It's a resistance that is necessary for you to exist within a second to the next second to the next second. This is not terrorism. Terrorism is ISIS. PKK do not go around beheading people. They do not go around kidnapping girls and selling them. One of the founding values of the PKK organization, aside from ecological protection, is women's rights. The PKK leader has said that you cannot have any sort of a liberation movement occurring within the Middle East if you do not liberate women. Women within the Middle East are one of the most oppressed groups you can find anywhere. And you have this male saying, hang on a second, how can I possibly be a revolutionary leader if I do not advocate for support of women's rights? Because to do so, to fail to do so, you're failing half of society and you can never progress as a community and as an organization. So again, I come back to the same question that Sibel raised. Why are we the terrorist? What do we have to do to raise awareness about the fact that we're secular, that we're pro-human rights, that we're pro-women's rights? More pro-women's rights, I would say, than Australian government and some of these Western societies. I'll finish very soon. I'm sorry, I've been going on for a while. I think something that we have to do as a community collectively is to start combating some of the prejudices that we have. When we think of the Middle East, again, we think of terrorism, we think of the Iraq war, we think of the Afghan war, Afghanistan war, and we see the Taliban, we see the Al-Qaeda organizations, and we see people who are celebrating because 9-11 happened. But there's so much diversity within the Middle East. There are so many different political, economic, social, ethno-religious groups and communities, and it is important that we do not band them together. It is important that we recognize each distinct ethno-religious identity and group as embodying a number of people as human beings. And this is really, really important because it goes back to the Yepaja and the Yepaga and the Pekaka because they identify each of these minority groups. They give them a name, they give them dignity, they give them a space to speak, to have a voice, to not be silent and silenced anymore. To me, they're the most liberal organization that has ever existed, but I am biased because I'm Kurdish. So I'm going to leave it there because I think I've talked for quite some time now. Um, and if you have any questions, please throw it at me in a very gentle and kind way, please. I'm a Kurdish person and I've been oppressed. <laughs> <laughs>